Three Friends, one amazing series of YA novels. An insatiable thirst to relive the glory that is K.A. Applegate's literary masterpiece. This is Fathomworth's The Dork Bajir Chronicles. Hello, and welcome to The Dork Bajir Chronicles, a podcast where we read through the Animorph series one book at a time and talk about it every week. Today, we'll be talking about Megamorphs, number three, Elfangor's Gift. My name is Mikhail, the host. I'm Tessa, the expert, and it's Elfanger's Secret. I yes suck. It is totally Elfanger's Secret. <laughs> <laughs> it was the, it's it's the Andalite's gift to Elfanger's Secret. I was thinking this one was called the Andalite's gift. It's very easy to get them mixed up because they're bad titles. Yep. You're right. <laughs> and our third host is Brayden. Um, the I had one, but I lost it. Oh well. Story of his life. Now time for... First piece of fan mail comes from at Kieran Andrews on Twitter. Uh, This is a tweet from a while ago, but they're saying... uh, Their tweet says, I just listened to Dork Bajir Chronicles for six hours straight. Totally worth it. Kind of helps that I'm in an eight-hour road trip. So it's like you're trapped in a car with us. (laughs) <laughs> you have no choice who wouldn't want to be except i have extreme halitosis and athlete's foot <laughs> i cannot stay in my seat i'm always taking over uh the person sitting next to me's seat like i'm always just scooching over into that other seat so i'm terrible for a car trip i constantly oh, shit my pants <laughs> it's true i used to live with him Ugh, gross anyways the next piece of fan mail comes from uh, mm, the savory at movie polls on Twitter. Movie polls. Always good for a fan of mail bit. Uh, this is from a while ago as well. Um, it's a meme they made that is the the caption is uh, when the animorphs morphed mosquitoes but ended up nearly dying in Z space in animorphs number eighteen, and then it's the picture of Thanos from Infinity Wars uh, where uh, what is this part? This is the part where they get the reality stone. I don't even remember. It's just... Anyways. Yeah. He says, all that for a drop of blood. I'm pretty sure it's like this huge... Oh, no. It's um when they're fighting on Titan and they beat the shit out of him for like 30 minutes and he gets... He, his like lip bleeds. Right. Like, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that's after he drops the literal moon on Tony Stark. That was hilarious. That's, yeah. That's... Death is funny. Um, <laughs> I mean, we're fans of Animorphs. We already know that we think death is funny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? XD. Um, yeah, let's talk about this cover. It's very bad. So the only person who's a little okay is Tobias in the back. He's got his arms crossed. That's okay. Yeah. But he's biting his upper lip. Like he's sucking it in and making a strange face. I think that's just the model's face. Or is that just how he looks? <laughs> It could be. Fuck. I apologize if that's the case and you're listening to this. But then beside him, we got, like, Marco is, you know, Marco is doing, like, some fast casual, just, like, slightly bent knee, leaning down on it. Like, he's paying attention to a coach at a soccer game. Like, he's in the huddle. He's good. Rachel has got, like, this weird, like, she's got, like, an eighth of a squat going and her hands are kind of there and her face is, like, ooh. She looks like she's pulling her pants down. I mean, her hand is completely splayed. So it's a weird way to pull your pants down if you just scooch it with your palms. But, I mean, you could do it, I guess. But in front of her is Jake <laughs> doing the most awkward open kneeling position. Like he's a dad of a little league team trying to pep them up for the big game, even though he knows that this is real life and not a movie and that they're going to lose very badly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then in front of him is Cassie doing this very <laughs> awkward squat. The best one, I think. (laughs) Just, like, ready to go, I guess, but her legs are together, so it's not even an action pose. It's like, you know, you're on a, you're on, it's like you're on an eight-hour road trip, and you've already listened to six hours of Phantomorphs, (laughs) and Brayden has inspired you, and you don't want to shit your pants, but your mom's like, come on, we gotta go! So you're, like, popping a squat in the ditch, trying, hoping nobody sees you? She looks like she's about to, like, uh, she's like the safety, and someone broke through the fucking defensive line for the first time in like (laughs) 17 years and you now have to defend the quarterback i think that's how it works and you're just like what do i do what what, what do i do Uh, 
Yeah. And then like just axe in the back, just the, they they just drew axing. one picture of an andalite and they use it whenever they need an andalite. It's the exact same expression and his little stock eyes are just so bugged out. It's wild. They really got it right with the Andalite Chronicles, so I don't know what the fuck happened, like, for the main series. Why is there this clip art Andalite in the back here? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's good. The cover is, like, shiny and solid. Um, Not, like, super solid. It's still a floppy cover like all the other covers. But it's um it's a little bit thicker than some of the other covers. This is one of the books that I used to own as a kid, so I did read it quite a bit. It was very good. You learn a lot about history. Oh yeah. And now that I'm coming back to it as an adult and I've kind of like spoiler alert, I've read some Shakespeare. I kinda know what's up. <laughs> I don't understand that statement. <laughs> oh, you will in a second. We talk about the Battle of Agincourt in this one, and uh, it was prominently featured in Shakespeare. Shakespeare talked about it. Yeah, but how's this? How's this for some knowledge? It's actually pronounced Agincourt. Oh, cool. It's actually pronounced Agincourt. In fact, they mention that right at the end of this book. They say, like, he took, yeah. he went there because I, Shakespeare. I, I, I'm like, that was like a juicy nugget I was going to drop at the end oh. of the summary, and you totally ruined it. Well... We're not, this isn't an entertainment podcast. This <laughs> is pure academics. This is our academic facts, the Dork Bajir Scholars podcast. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's get into it. So the opening chapter is Tobias talking about happiness and, you know, kind of explaining the world as you do in the first chapter of an Animorphs book. But then, yeah, he gets into his typical Tobias thing, talking about happiness and like, well, you know half glass full half glass empty when the glass is half full that's when i'm like walking with melissa and wondering if she'll hold your hand and then as a kid i mean i'd read some mass-produced paperback novels for children and i'd caught many typos before and i thought this was just one of those things till you get to the end of the chapter and tobias says even the slaves following behind their masters seem to be having fun and you're like oh dang what's up yeah, they kind of just dropped the word slaves in. I didn't understand that until I read the start of the next chapter. I I thought that was like some shitty metaphor, or some middling metaphor for um, what they were doing for like how yerks and people work. Mm. but uh, And controllers work. All of a sudden, try to, instead of calling them controllers, they'll call them slaves. Yeah. In fact, when we got to the Melissa part, I thought I I was confused there too because it's um as they figure out like there's only two channels now. Rachel is gone from the group and Melissa is there. Uh some weird alien with like wrinkly avocado skin that we maybe have seen twice in the last 10 books shows up and Marco starts morphing Grizzly Bear, his favorite morph, and you're like, "All right, things are things are definitely wrong." The Drode, which is the weird avocado alien, snaps his fingers. Everyone remembers the correct timeline and is like, oh, holy shit. Melissa's gone. Rachel's there. And they realize that the disgraced Visser 4, after being demoted and um, embarrassed from his horrible loss on the Lyran home planet in book 18, he was like whining and crying and found his way to the time matrix that Prince Elfangor had buried in the construction site. What eventually became the construction site after the events of uh, the Andalite Chronicles. Yes. So, this is going to be a time traveling adventure, folks. The Drode is like, all right, we don't actually like that a Yurk has the most powerful machine in existence. So, because Cryak and the Elemis don't really, you know, they can't interfere, we're going to have you guys take care of it. Um, And we'll tie, you know, He's like, how do I dumb this down for you? Which, like, that's a perfect explanation when you want to be like, there's got to, there's like some crazy scientific way to explain this, but let's not get into it because I don't want to, you know, work hard on creating my metaphors or my whole world (laughs) war. Let's just say that I'm way more smarter than the main characters. Let's dumb it down for you. (laughs) We'll tie your essence to the time matrix so that wherever it goes, you'll follow and your personalities and memories will be intact no matter what changes history happens. So that's okay. We follow along. That makes sense to me. 
and then that's the perfect line where Rachel is just like, don't do it yet. I want to pack. Not yet. And of course, they're already in the middle of France and it's in the middle of the night and it's raining and she's screaming this at a night. I kind of like the way that they skipped so fast to it because it was like, it's clear that the intention is to do a time skippy book, right? Yeah. And we also know that we are incredibly bound by format because this is the real world and we're publishing for children. Yep. Fuck. And I mean, like, they shoved a lot of time skipping into this book, which we'll talk about at the end. Yeah, it's fuck. like yeah. chapter three. They're in the first, like, chapter three or four. They're, like, in the, in the, in the, in France, like, in the yeah, first man. instance. And they jump to, like, what is it, four or five different places? And it's, it's wild. It's so wild. So, yeah, good. It, they, they just get right into it so fast. And, um, so one thing that the Droad says is that, uh, and out of it. One Spoilers. thing the drone says is that um, <laughs> Kryak just will, you know, Kryak just demands one sacrifice and then you guys can follow along and your memories will be intact and everything will be fine. And both Cassie and Marco know immediately, okay, no, Kryak's always wanted to kill Jake. We gotta, we gotta protect him. So that's kind of their idea. But then when they jump back in time, not everyone's not together. Their atoms are spaced out. So Rachel and Cassie are stuck trying to decipher what these French knights are screaming at them. Um, Cassie's just like, oh, sor- sorcerers. English sorcerers. <laughs> perfect. And Rachel's like, this is the perfect time for me to morph an elephant. So they're <laughs> the best the best time, like when Jake and Marco come upon them. We've got Cassie as a wolf and Rachel as an elephant. Cassie Rachel's holding a knight in her trunk and like beating another knight with him. And Jake wanders in and is just like, Oh, you know, so we just snuck past the guards and we're trying to be cool and quiet, and then I hear a fucking elephant. And Rachel's like, Are you mad? I think he's mad. It's so funny. <laughs> And he does say yeah. fucking in this. He does say book. fucking in this one. This is the only um, Animorphs book where they swear, at least until book forty-five. And it makes it makes uh, it specifies that you could see his hard cock inside of his sweatpants. Yeah, they they're also all wearing sweatpants in this one for some reason. <laughs> Hot. So they decide okay they're gonna morph birds they've got to find viscer four how are they gonna do that it takes a bit but then they realize hey viscer four is gonna be the only one that's not full of pock marks and stuff marco says some funny things about how the english army is like having their third mass and it's like hey by that point you must not have any hope that you know you're gonna survive right you're basically just saying oh hey st peter make my bed for me i'm coming there soon i it's funny because so this battle um, inspired this battle inspired William Shakespeare to write, uh, among other things, the King Henry V. Mm-hmm. Um, so King Henry the V, um, they see him. He's like there with some of his guys, and he leaps onto a log and starts giving them a speech. And Marco remarks, "It's like all of the speeches that we animorphs give each other right before we head long into terrible battle." They find Visser Four. He's an English archer. They're all birds of prey, and the archers start loosing arrows, and they're like, fuck. So Marco gets hit, lands sticks in the mud. Rachel's like, I'm a great big bird. I can pull him up. No, oops, I can't. Cassie morphs a horse, runs in to try and get them out, and they, like, dig their talons into her legs so she can carry them away. But by then, the soldiers are upon them, both sides fighting. Uh, Tobias... Fucking like Axe keeps a bead on Visser Four and sees that he's aiming an arrow at the English King Henry. Tells Tobias about it because Tobias is the only one who swoops down and catches the arrow in midair like some Robin Hood maneuver. And then morphs Horkbajir, rides Jake as a horse into battle, scares the the war for a second because they think a devil's coming, so they can get Cassie and Marco and Rachel out of there. Axe follows Visser Four into a nearby town. He's hiding in a church. Uh, Axe like or Tobias and Jake come to the rescue and Tobias is pushing away all these villagers that have like torches and pitchforks that are trying to hurt uh, Andalite Axe. Um, Tobias grabs like a pitchfork from one of them and shoes them away and then enters what is a church. And he's like, I am so sorry. I'm a hork holding a a pitchfork in a church in the year 1415. I am so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, religion. Oh, religion. So fragile. (laughs) Anyways. Right. Sorry. 
I mean, at the end of this series, they basically kill God. So it's like, you mean what's Hitler? the point? What are you trying to say? <laughs> no, the series, they kill God, not the book. Mm-hmm. Um, but so they, they call across Visitor 4. He's reached this great big white orb. I wonder what that is. Suddenly, they're on the banks of the Delaware River in the middle of the night. Um, Marco steals some boots from some soldier. <laughs> Jake chastises him. Marco's like, yo, I'm not going to be time traveling without boots on. Um, they realize this is when George Washington is crossing the river. So they sneak on board some boats and then uh, they know because these kids know their American history, which is good because I didn't as a kid reading because uh, I'm a bad American. Or am I? Cool. Yurks, you can never catch me now. You're a bad American. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so they're crossing the river. But instead of George Washington and his troops surprising the guys on the other side, Mr. Four has gone over there, told them about this secret invasion. And the bad guys, or I don't know, the guys George Washington was evading. I haven't seen Hamilton. I don't know what's happening. But they start firing. It's a bloody mess. Cassie is a dolphin in the river. And... um. Bodies are falling around her, and one of those bodies is Jake's. He gets shot in the forehead, falls off the boat into the river, and then pop. We're in sunny, sunny, warm water. It's the Trafalgar battle against Napoleon. Do you guys know anything about this? I just I finished a book that was based it, like in the 1800s, right when Napoleon was doing all of his wars. So yeah. I know a little bit about this. In the real world, this was the British fleet versus Napoleon's army. And the British had like the biggest fleet. Napoleon so far had never been defeated on land, even though he had so little in like, even though the armies he was up against has so much more men than his own men, he had never been defeated. So now he's fighting against the British, uh, the British Navy. And uh, it's, I think it was a Napoleon defeat, but... The British Admiral was killed. But as a kid, I didn't know any of this. And that's okay, because the Animorphs did not know any of this either. They were like, what's going on? We don't even know what's supposed to happen. Um, It's things get pretty crazy. Rachel turns into a chimpanzee and tries to, like, crawl to stop a bomb that Visser 3 is lighting. And she gets blown in half and sees her the other half of her body holding on to the mast. Do you say Visser 3? I think. Sorry, I did say Visser 3. I meant to say Visser 4. Spoiler alert, Visser 3 doesn't show up in this book. Just <laughs> Visser 4. Um, so then it's like, then we switch, and now we're in Princeton, 1934, and Rachel shows up, and everyone is surprised because they had seen her blown in half. What the fuck? Turns out Jake is the only one who dies, and that means that none of the rest of them can die. Which is great, yeah. because after Princeton, they jump into World War II. But in Princeton, so Visser IV goes there because he's supposed to try and talk with Einstein. But Einstein's not there where he's supposed to be. So already history has changed. Cassie, during Trafalgar, she stayed as a dolphin and was just, like, ignoring the pain of Jake being gone. So now she's a beach dolphin. She demorphs. Somebody sees her, calls her the N-word, and she turns into a polar bear to eat their face off. <laughs> just to clarify, though, they don't put the N-word to print. The cowards. The they cowards? always say that this, um, yeah. I wasn't talking to you, boy, speaking to Marco. I was talking to this thing here. And then in the book, it just says, and then he said something I would not repeat. Right. Or like, you know, he said like a very horrible word. So we can assume it's something pretty bad. When I was a kid, I think I thought it was bitch because I read this book when I was like 10 and I didn't know any better. <laughs> you ragamuffin. I know. You thought. I'm a, I'm a thought. That's what I is. I'm a thought. So Visser 4 starts jerking them around because there's a little bit of a delay between when Visser 4 shows up somewhere and when the gang pops in behind him so they're like flash they're in the middle of a shopping mall flash they're in the middle of like a forest he's going crazy and then it's normandy d-day storming the beach by the english because there's no americans um tobias he's in hork morph he finds a man with a familiar looking mustache and pulls him out of a car and puts his wrist blade to his throat and cassie's like no that He's not Hitler in this timeline. He's just some weird chauffeur. But while they're talking about this and the guy is like, please, this 
random guy is like, please let go of my chauffeur. And they're trying to figure out, or chauffeur, or however you pronounce it. They're trying to figure out what's going on. Some people shoot. A chauffeur is something entire. He's a, he's a driver. Yeah, that's a chauffeur. No, it's different. Not on a battlefield, no. But it's oh. different in a way that I can't explain why it's different. Okay. Chauffeurs, like, are also, to some extent, like, a butler. Oh, okay. Yeah. That would make yeah. sense. But a driver would just be a driver. Mm-hmm. I think as a kid, I just thought he was in a limo for a bit. I didn't really put it together. <laughs> like, oh, you know, there's a battle going on. They're not going to go further up the road and there's a limo with the driver. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I did read very fast, but maybe I was a stupid child. I don't know. Anyway, Tobias has shot a whole bunch, and he feels his wrist plate cut. He feels his wrist plate cut deep. And he beheads Hitler, alternate timeline Hitler. And the bullets, he ends up fine. The bullets don't harm him after all. Um, Grenade drops a, gr- sorry, grenade? Rachel. Rachel drops a grenade into a tank as an eagle. Um, Axe is uh, stuck as a fly, I think, and he's observing the battle on the beach for a bit and is just horrified at what's going on. The tank, well, anyway, Rachel drops the grenade into the tank, which blows up, injuring Visser 3 extremely badly. The Yurk escapes the dying host body. Uh, Marco kills the Yurk, throws it against the burning tank, so it sizzles and pops, which is disgusting. And then they talk to the host of Visser 4. I think I've been saying Visser 3 again. Yeah, I don't even notice because yeah. I've been thinking well, that also. Yeah. I think there's, okay, to be clear for anyone who hasn't read this book, Visser 3 is not in it. He's not in Anytime it. Anytime we mention Visser, it's Visser 4. It's only Visser 4. And now Visser 4 is dead and they're talking to the host, John Berryman. And John's telling them about his secret plan because as we know, hosts and yurks, like, the Yurk knows everything about the host, but the host gets a bit from the Yurk, right? So he tells them about his plan, about, you know, how he wants to change the world. And some of the, the Animorphs were like, yeah, okay, some of these make sense. What about the whole Battle of Agincourt way at the beginning? Agincourt. And John Berrien laughs and he's like, well, that's because I was an actor and I bothered him to death with my memorized Shakespeare monologues. I'm an actor. Asinine. Like, I don't me. know. Like, I was like, obviously somebody would try this and it's crazy that it worked. Like, it makes me so happy. <laughs> Just like reciting monologues over and over to harass your yerk. It makes sense from John's point of view. It makes zero sense from fucking Visser Four's point of view. Like, he takes so many risks with his life even to do this stupid thing that would probably, if we're thinking of it logically, John Berryman would then just quote something else at him. Yeah. Yeah, because then they decide, Cassie's like, John, when did your parents meet? And he tells her the day and he tells her the place and they use the time matrix to go there so that his parents never meet. They end up, instead of finding his parents, they end (laughs) up just like having an argument and because they're there and it's this big white orb they distract all the hippies so it doesn't happen which raises some questions to what really happened on the Lyran and home planet now but we'll get into that bam back in the present day john berryman never became infested by a yurk viscer four never happened somehow which means the time thing didn't never existed which means jake never died loophole oh, no. wait 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 wait. john berryman was the host that viscer four took after the Lyran and home world no, I'm pretty Not sure during. he was the host the whole time. I don't think so. Why Brandon? would they give him a different host? Why would they bring John Berryman all the way to the Lyran homeworld? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. They would have used a hork or something like that, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe or maybe not. I don't know. No, I, I'm pretty sure I had that same question, and so I very specifically went back and looked at some summaries, and they say that John Berryman is the one that he takes before. Or, like, sorry, after. Like, after he's demoted and disgraced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, here, have this shitty actor. (laughs) I think they're just, like, get into the pool and you're now in line for a host. Like, I'm sure that's how they do it, right? Like. I don't know. It's just very interesting to me that as soon as a Visser, like, okay, so we read book 30 and then we read this one. So as soon as a Visser is disgraced by a plan, then they're just kind of on the run and left to do whatever. Instead of being under, you'd think that they would be under lock and key or, like seriously demoted or something 
right? Here, I just read the summary on Cyropedia. An actor named John Berryman discovers the time matrix buried at the abandoned construction site. Then he is infested by Visser 4, who was demoted after the Lyran homeworld. Oh, so John what? Berryman actually already had the time matrix. Or at least he found what? it and didn't know what it was. I think what happened was he found it and didn't know what it was and was like, ah, oh, that was weird. Anyway, back to practicing monologues. He got yerked. The yerk was like, I know what that is. Let's go back to that thing. That's what I just said. I what mean, you this? said that. Are we in a time matrix loop right now? What is going on? It's book. It's it's pre Megamorphs number three, Mikhail. And he's here telling me, be careful. Tessa's going to try to trick you with her. Uh, Great. Feminine knowledge. wiles. <laughs> I was going to say, like, slave owner trickery. No! she's from the alternate timeline. <laughs> oh, my God. If anything, you're from the alternate timeline, Mikhail. Why else did you want to call yourself the host of this podcast? Ooh. Because it's a real word. Got you there. Ooh. No, she didn't, Brayden. Jesus. I got, no, I got him. I got you. took you rights. <laughs> like a sucker. You have been snatched, as the youth say. Why did you pick the X? Ex- also, something we never talked about was like, do they even call them hosts everywhere? It's going to be a different word in different places with different languages also even. But also, yeah. are the Yerks infested everywhere or are they just in this one spot in America? Remember how like in Harry Potter where they were muggles in England, but then they were no magic in America? No magiki. But yeah, but like what What if they're the Yerks? So the Yerks want to take over the world and they're just starting with this one small spot. So, okay, well, we're supposed to think that, but like... Pretty sure they said an international leader is yerked. Well, that was just a that was also just a rumor. It could have been. My theory is that that was Visser Three lying to make himself look cooler, like an edge lord. Lying to the Chi, who he has no contact with. Just lying to his. Just lying just to everybody. Everyone. Just lying to all of the yerks he met. They're always listening. Well, he, I don't think <laughs> he knows about the Chi. He just wants the people who follow him to be in shock and awe of him. Oh my yeah. god. So it's not a plan, it's just like bragging. It's just blatant lying and okay. bragging. <laughs> Braggadocio for no real reason and lying about dumb things that don't make sense that can be easily disputed. Just to make yourself look some kind of good. Yeah. Yeah. Also, do you think this is like a huge burn on Brits where it's like uh killing the King of England actually would have no effect on time? Or history. <laughs> In fact, you're like a mere footnote. It's a very American look at like that kind of thing. Like this incredibly important geopolitical event is somewhat of a nuisance. I will wipe it out from well, history. I think in like this one, um, in, in like the fixed timeline, the King of England didn't die because the because Tobias caught the arrow, right? And then they chased yeah. him away. Well, he doesn't die in real life either, right? No, you he doesn't that, die right? in real life. Yeah, yeah. In real life, they totally win this battle, and King Henry goes on to, like, rule France for a bit. Sure. That sounds not 100% right, but that does sound like something. Also, if you're interested, there is a very good Bernard Col- Cornwell book called Agincourt with a Z. Uh, that's pretty much would answer any questions. That like we as in court? Like the way it's actually supposed to be spelled. This, what do people think of this book? I really liked this as, like, I thought it was a solid Megamorphs book, which are kind of their own standalone. I thought yeah. it was better for time travel than the dinosaurs one, um, simply because it was, like, you got to go through all these different places, and you got kind of got to see how your choices changed the future while you were still trying to change the future. I think I ended up, yeah, I think in the end, I personally ended up enjoying, um the time of the dinosaurs more because like I just felt it was a more singular concise story maybe not overall a strong one but it certainly was one story this one just kept on jumping around and then Mm. just ends just (laughs) like with the status quo having been uh found again completely by accident in a way, this one makes way more sense than Megamorphs 2. Because in Megamorphs 2, it was like, what if we go back to a time that let's pretend for a second actually existed, which we know wasn't real. 
uh, thanks to Scotty. Let's pretend that it actually was like the day the meteor was supposed to hit. Let's also pretend that like everything was actually happening, the aliens and stuff. To assume that you could then like set the timeline right by doing something, like readjusting it so the meteor hits is completely illogical. The nice part about this one is like some guy goes back in time and fucks up like two things and immediately everything after is fucked. And like nothing makes sense anymore. <laughs> and if you think about it, that actually is a lot more realistic than oh, I pinch these people off at different points in time and everything's fine and nothing is affected. Like in real life, shit like this, if the time matrix existed, this would is exactly what would have happened is that like just by the time you jump the fifth time the thing you went there to do is no longer a thing that was even going to happen in the first place and in fact i'm a little shocked that viscer 4 had no fucking idea that that was going to happen yeah he's just i feel like viscer 4 just kind of flew into this with no plan because you know he's so disgraced and ashamed he's trying to do anything we know that there is a governing body above the Vizzers, so I'm wondering if the Vizzers aren't, like, touted as statesmen, but they're honestly just generals under the purview of this governing body that's above Vizzers, and, like, told, like, oh yeah, you're important, you're a political leader, but only hired for, like, their brutality and, like, usability. See, I got the impression that it was like the Vissers, there are two types. There's the politician and there's the general. But, or like maybe even the tactician. Like, I feel like Visser 3 is the general that they go and it's like, we need to like fuck up stuff and fuck civility and fuck subtlety. We'll send Visser 3 in to fuck shit up. Visser 1 is the one that, the, I haven't read Visser, so I know this is going to answer some of those questions, but like, they'll send Visser 1 in to be like, oh, this person will take the perfect host and figure out the best way to subdue an enemy that maybe brute force wouldn't work against, right? Visser 4, maybe it's just like, I don't know. <laughs> like, this guy's a fucking, like, wild card. This guy is great at water. Yeah, this guy uh, really sucking into frogs. So, like, let's just do so. Maybe he was just, like, the first <laughs> Yurk to get a Lyran controller. Yeah, but like a Lyran host, and then they're just like, "You're the general now." The the end. Oh, it could be. I mean, that's you're the I dude. feel like that's what happened to Visser Three. He got Prince Aloran and was just like, "They're like, all right, you're so hot and buff now. We have no choice but to promote you." That's a that's a tip. All of our li listeners listening right now who want to uh, get ahead in the workforce, just get hot and buff. Steal a buff dude and just like bring him around on a leash with a gag and people will really respect that like wow you kicked that chad's ass <laughs> have a promotion or no you just have to make your own body become buff and beautiful and then that sounds like work yeah, yeah but like you know how hard viscer 3 worked for that body did you do you remember hork was your chronicles with all of his like he had to go on the computer so many times to study andalite behavior and it finally paid off do you guys think that they could have published this book today oh hmm. no the publishers would have been like we gotta x out like the whole first two chapters can we just start where they're already in france it's weird right because i i'm conflicted about it because like at the one point it's just like it's just kind of a dumb book that takes like it may, I mean, they're famous for, like, not knowing the context, like, of what they're writing in, right? The dinosaur one was a pretty good example of, like, listen, there was information even at the time that this was written that you didn't look up to find out what the truth was about it. So I don't think, like, to so to say that, like, if the Nazis had won the Second World War, would we have slaves in 2018? Uh, I mean, even that is a stretch. Well, no. If the Nazis won, we would we would have had slaves. That was a key part of... I mean, maybe... And I don't think the Nazis won in this timeline was the idea. I think it was just that slavery never ended because the English stayed in charge. Which is... Yeah, that's pretty dubious territory. I don't think... I also just don't think it's true. Like, it's... uh. Hey, Michael Crichton reference coming your way, Tessa. I know you like Michael Crichton. 
in in timeline the book where they go back in time and it's very scientific they're like well the team is like well what if i kill my grandpa and then the guy who's running is like well why would you do that and he's like i don't know what if i did and it's like but you wouldn't and then he was like well what if i kill someone who i don't know is related to me but leads to my like it was stamping out of my existence he's like how do you know it would lead to you like how, how do you know that killing that person would mean you don't exist like the world is so much more complicated than that. What he's saying is that history marches on. Like there's very few moments in a war even that are like this will definitely absolutely change the zeitgeist of the entire planet a hundred years from now. There are many moments in many wars that shape the earth the way it is. But to say that you could go back in time and kill Hitler and – then World War II is over? Fuck no. Of course not. Like, people would take over for Hitler, especially if you killed him near the end of the war, or at least, like, let's say midpoint in the war, right? So I forgot what my initial point was, actually. <laughs> it's just, I think it was, like, it's impossible to know how your actions, if you were to go back into the past and change something, it's impossible to guess how your your changes would affect you or the future, just because the world is so incredibly varied and like wild and like you said like it marches on without you like it just things other things are going to keep happening i think also some things are like inevitable like some cultural things are inevitable like the abolishment of slavery will eventually be a worldwide thing i know there's still slaves in the world now but yeah is there does that mean there's going to be slaves a thousand years forever from now? no I, th I think i agree with you like even when slavery was in its heyday there was people who weren't slavers because they knew it was wrong and they didn't want to do it. Like they still, you know, it wasn't as popular because people were like, Hey, I can, I can have a slave and it's legal. Hell yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you know, like people still knew. It's hard to say whether or not maybe they were at a point where that was going to happen. And like, we just don't see that, but I don't know. It's, it, I guess it's like, it's a kid's book and it's also like, trying to show how evil it would be if they didn't go back in time and what's the best way to do that take the most evil things from american history and make those happen now basically it's a way to show that it's yeah like life is very bad now like and people are bad because as a kid you know that slaves are bad so it's a it's a good way to shock yeah. the audience into being like uh oh things aren't normal i mean well, slavery is bad not slaves no, sorry, yes. Slavery is bad. <laughs> I get yeah. you. Brayden's been silent because he's trying to work out all the the time loops that happened. I'm sorry, I thought about slavery and uh, hot, hot studly dudes and gags and gallers, and I just, I've just been trying, I got lightheaded from my boner. Oh, Jesus, okay. There are moments in time where, where history can be changed in big meaningful ways like um i think the key i don't believe in individual like great man theory like if you killed hitler somebody like him would have happened and led the masses to do it anyway you don't believe that that could happen or you do believe that? i do believe that somebody else would have right. done a hitler okay <laughs> okay books are art someone would have done a hitler yeah. 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 But if the Great Depression never happened, I don't believe that Germany would be in a place where that sort of like coup could happen. That sort of like that sort of yeah, that sort of desperate split down party lines in an otherwise stable democracy. I don't believe that would have happened. What about even simpler, like, if Franz Ferdinand had never been assassinated, then, like, yeah, the whole World War I would have been different, right? Because maybe it would yes. be somebody else. Would have been different, but probably still would have happened. Probably still would have happened because tensions were high, but it would have been yeah, different true. and alliances would have been different. And then that, you right. know, could maybe Germany wouldn't have been economically crippled from having to pay all these reparations after World War I. But I, yeah. I agree with you, Brayden. Like, if sweeping things didn't happen, like, the Great Depression is not a single moment in oh, time. Yeah, it's a huge, a huge combination. combination. Like, what if the Romans didn't invest as much as they did into roads? All of Europe would be a totally different place today. 
speaking of Rome and bridges, um, one moment in history that I know everything would have gone differently if one little thing didn't go right was... If they um, had just thrown the ring into the Mount Doom at the first point <laughs> rather than letting Frodo get it? Uh, no, no. Uh, it's the Battle of Milvian Bridge. The Battle of Milvian Bridge is probably the moment that most people agree that Christianity became um, fated to be the primary religion of the entire Western Hemisphere. Because Emperor Co- the Emperor Constantine I led his army to this bridge and was mostly getting his ass kicked on this bridge. But then he came up to all of his men and painted a cross on each of their shields and said, this is your God. This is the sun. If we get out of here, it'll be because of him. And then they win by sheer luck, by most accounts. And so all these, all the, yeah, this is what Emperor Constantine pretty much gave this victory to Christianity and voila. I agree. I I do think, and I guess I don't want to say that like there are no single moments that don't greatly influence history. It's more just like the idea that you could pluck that moment out and assume and to know the way it will affect history okay, is, is folly. Something else might have happened. Like, yeah, I I think, yeah, I think I agree with you guys. Like if you, you know, like one single conversation is very important. And if you get rid of one of those people in that conversation, well, maybe somebody else would fill in and all of the plans would still be made and everything would still be carried out. Um, but like, you know, like the Great Depression or sweeping things. We should probably get back to the book. This is all really interesting. Yes. I can but that's more, this, I feel but... like that's more, that's way more difficult to have any, like, what, <laughs> Visser 4 goes back to the 20s and, you know, stops the stock market from crashing. Um, and the kids, like, get to hang out and try and stop the Great Depression from happening. The goals become much more complicated. Like, they'd have to, like, become economists and stuff like that. <laughs> like, yeah, it's not going to happen. <laughs> I will say, so we know for sure in book canon, at when was this book published? Let me go to Seropedia. It was released in May 1999. Um, but in the book, Cassie talks about when, when they're at the Battle of Agincourt and they're looking for Visser IV. They're like, Cassie's like, yes, we have to look. Visser IV has got a 20th century body, 21st century body. What it might have mean? been it might have been produced in 1999, but it's 2000s in the Animorphs years, baby. Oh. I mean, I don't think that they care that much. <laughs> it's a very specific gripe. I appreciate Not it. Not a gripe. I think that this is a fact that it is now 2008 and we're just 2000 and late. Ooh, Can you imagine if Visser 4 like went back and stopped the 2008 housing crisis? <laughs> we would not have that movie about it. Come on, Visser 4. Um, I thought it was interesting. This maybe is like my last point on it. Then my last major point was that. Well, actually, I kind of wanted to know how Brayden's reaction went to the Drode coming back. You know, it wasn't much. It's like, oh, something time travel is happening. I I guessed it would be the time matrix. I just. Yeah. I I don't I don't know what to think about the Drode. It's like we've seen him what twice now. Yeah, I think like who cares? I yeah, it's like I don't care. I don't. No. <laughs> okay, good because I remember you were excited about the Drode at first. Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm interested in it, but like I guess maybe I'm just sort of looking back on it without. And seeing, like, oh, it didn't turn out that he was that interesting or necessary in this. But, like, yeah, I don't... It, the Drode was just here in this book. I would have liked to see more of him, but I didn't. <laughs> I think uh, the presence of Cryak... The fact that, like, the Drode even came to... This is the point I was going to make earlier of... To ask the Animorphs to do anything about this, which is a pretty huge game changer if they see the planet earth the yurks and the andalites as their quote-unquote chess pieces uh the fact that the drode came to the animorphs and asked them 
hey, you should fix this problem for us. That's a pretty serious problem. Uh, and also, we need one of you to die in order for this plan to like be okay for both Cryak and the Elemist. It's a pretty good indication that maybe the Animorphs are a bigger deal than we maybe have known that they have been that's a weird way of saying that i'm yeah. saying like we don't know up to this point like what kind of crazy shit is happening all over the planet at all times with the yerk war but for the drode to come to the animorphs it's like this might be like the highest the 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 hottest climate for the war in the whole planet if they're coming to these like five fucking teenagers the fact that they didn't go to the chi also is like what <laughs> okay Weird. I mean, the Chi are pacifists. What, what could they have done to stop Visser 4? Like, are they allowed to hold people down? I feel like... No, I know? mean, there was, like, um, Eric's father held uh, Rachel in her bear form in, like, a wrestling move. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? And then it's like, you hold Visser 4 down after you run, it a run after you him. You just give with, him like, a big Jedi hug speed. and don't move. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So anyways, I thought it was interesting. Because... The only reason I could see them going to the Animorphs instead of the Chi is because – I might be overthinking this, but they knew that the Chi would never agree to die, right? Yes. They would never agree to like – even if one Chi dies, who cares? But with the Animorphs, they're like, well, at least we can get one of them to die because we consider – like the implication being that we consider them to be a threat to our the cause. The bigger threat. Ah. Oh. Yeah. I like that. I like how you're thinking. That's cool. Listen, this is the podcast for fucking the deepest, deepest dives. Welcome to the Into deep Bajir Chronicles. And lore <laughs> and, and sexual depravity. We're the deepest, deepest boys. I will say that this makes, okay, this book makes Elfanger's crash landing in book one way sadder. Because it's not like he just randomly ended up at the construction site. He was going there for a reason. Yeah. A last ditch attempt to return to Lauren and go back to his wife and baby son. That's not what he was doing. That's not what he was doing. I mean, it could He was been. going to get the time matrix to yeah. do some crazy time matrix shit and he just died. I mean, like, he was going to do the time matrix to go back in time to be with his wife. <laughs> no, he totally wasn't. I, don't I feel think like, okay, I don't so think he John was. Berryman is a failed actor. I don't know. We know he's an actor. I can assume he's a failed actor. Because they gave, you know, he's obviously not powerful or special enough for that being a, a yerk put in him is an insult. So he, maybe he <laughs> moonlights as like a construction worker to try and make any kind of money. He moonlit as a construction worker? I mean, I like, like not that literally. You... <laughs> he daylights as a construction worker to feed his moonlighting acting and, let's face it, stand-up comedy. Brayden has a pretty legit question, though, which is how like this thing is huge how did no one find it if he didn't yeah. like wander into the construction site at night and then like something caved in and then he found it because if he was just like working as a laborer and found it, it would be like um there's 18 other people around no see like, th this is an abandoned construction site so he went there to practice Oh, yeah. <laughs> but also, okay, like this fucking construction site, David throws a rock and just breaks open a whole wall to find the blue box. I want to say John Berryman somehow tripped, fell face down in the dirt, and this caused an earthquake that all of the dirt beneath him flowed down and the time matrix just suddenly was there. He was in a hole with the time matrix. Isn't that actually the plot of the Lego movie? Is it the Lego movie? Probably. Yeah, I remember he like works at a construction site and then stumbles down and like accidentally glues himself to the lid. Everything is awesome. That's a very good song. There's another one coming out. I'm very excited about. It, those were so. That was like it was like a Saturday morning eating sugary cereal kid excitement. Yeah. Basically, the opposite feelings that Animorphs gives me. <laughs> do you guys want to do a quick, 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 quick? I mean, the beautiful Tobias Rachel kiss at Princeton. Please, more. Yeah, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. I came. But then when March, when Marshall, when Marco falls in the mud at, at Agincourt, Rachel's like, no one else says shit. And Rachel's like, save my bae. And you know what? I'll throw this bone to you, Mikhail. Earlier, when Ew, Marco sick. realizes that Visser 4 is going to have a 21st century body, um, 
there's a copyright on that name copyright me 21st century body gonna use it for a movie um uh-huh. then he says jake rachel everyone this or four has an like a 21st century body <laughs> yeah he tells the leader and then he calls for rachel do you think, hey, Braden, do you think this would have affected the timeline in, in such a crazy way that Ozzy's hit single would have been changed to 21st Century Body Man? <laughs> <laughs> and, yes. And... I believe that that's fine. I believe that's a doable. Okay, good. I like that. Okay. Uh, um, next week in our biweekly episode, or is it last week, Time Matrix? Oh! In our bi-weekly episode of The Speaking Tree, we'll be talking about uh, how would you have dealt with closing the time loop after Marco killed Visser 4? Also, how would you have used the time matrix and morphing to improve your own life? And lastly, how would you have used a warhorse or chimp or hork morph in your own life for purely personal, selfish reasons? Tessa, where can people find our stuff? You can find our stuff on our podcast page at collectivelegacy.org or on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, or Facebook. Remember to subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Or else we'll go back in time and make your parents never meet. Or else we'll go back in time and make Tessa say that line. Ooh. Or else we'll go back in time... Okay, go ahead. I don't have anything else to do. Or else we'll go back in time and become Huey, Lewis, and the News. Oh my god, can We're we gonna do that go actually? back in time. Oh, oh, oh. You can show your support for our show at our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash D-O-R-K-B-A-J-I-R. We offer special bonuses for patrons like access to our Discord server, Animorphs essays written by us, and much, much more. If we raise our goal of $500 a month, we will use our time matrix to make everyone have $100,000. No promises. Um, but what we can't promise is that if you are at the Horkbusher <laughs> level or higher, we'll give you a shout out at the end of every episode. Starting with... Big shout out to new patron, Max Sanicut, colon, the, um, the King Henry that survived. Michael Armenta, colon, the board game king. Andrew Vila, colon, the gamer. Greg Della Posta, colon, the Captain Nelson. And Yanka, colon, the dolphin. Shanna, colon. The jacket? Mariah Wamby, colon, the fact that Hitler was a driver in this one. <laughs> Martha Urquhart, colon, the supreme leader. Steam driven, colon, the slave. For the Phantomorphs, my name is Mikhail, the host, lowercase h. I'm Tessa, the expert, uppercase e. And I'm Brayden, the newbie, uppercase w. What? The real N word. And this has been <laughs> N-word, the door picture. <laughs> Listen, maybe that was the word that they used, and Cassie was just like, that's horrible. I'm not a newbie, I've been morphing for ages. I'm the most <laughs> natural at it. I am an experienced slave owner. <laughs> Hi, hello, welcome to the ad for the show. I'm Mitch, the host of Wank Talk Radio. On this show, I talk to interesting people about interesting things. Do you need to know more than that? Okay, fine. Pretty much, we'll talk about whatever my guest is interested in or passionate for. Sometimes it'll be silly, sometimes serious, sometimes a bit of both. Whatever the topic is, hopefully we'll find a way to make you that much more of an expert about it. You can find us at CollectiveLegacy.org, along with some other equally awesome shows on our network. New episodes of Whack Talk Radio are every Sunday and Thursday, wherever you find your podcasts. Let us know what you think on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Whack Talk Radio. That's W-E-N-G-H Talk Radio. Whack Talk Radio. 
brought to you by Collective Legacy, a podcast network.